You're listening to Economics Detective Radio. My guest today is Akin Unver. Uh, he is an assistant professor of international relations at Kadir Haas University. Akin, welcome to Economics Detective Radio. Um, hello. Thank you for inviting me. So our topic today will be some of Akin's research related to the attempted coup d'etat in Turkey in July 2016. Uh, What makes Akin's research on this so interesting is that he uses data gathered from social media to study exactly what happened, when, and where uh, as individual citizens documented events in real time through apps like Twitter and Instagram. So Akin, let's start by discussing the coup itself and the sort of geopolitical side of things. Then we can move on to the more technical details of your analysis later on in the episode. So first, give us some background details about Turkish politics before this coup attempt. Uh, you know, what, what should you know an outsider know to put it into context? That is, I mean, that's a task so far uh, no scholar or academic managed to uh, accomplish, mm-hmm. uh, basically put this into context for outsiders. And um, when you go to places like, you know, London, Washington, D.C., Brussels, um, you actually witness and, and, and see that um, kind of dislocation between uh, the feeling and the trauma in Turkey versus how really few outsiders have you know much clue about what's going on what happened and why it's that important turkey is i mean no alien to coups actually there was one in 1960 one in 1971 one in 1980 uh, there are two not coups but uh, military uh, kind of uh, interventions without actually pouring a lot of troops in the streets 1997 maybe 2007 as well. So military has always been an influential and dominant force in Turkish politics. In the last few years, that role was uh, you know, largely minimized by a number of um, legal cases, uh, largely built on fabricated evidence or illegally collected evidence that implicated a lot of Turkish um, generals, commanders, officers, but I mean, Turkey is a strange place, and now the political momentum is shifting back uh, into the favor of uh, you know formerly alienated parts of the military. But why exactly the coup happened? Um, the narrative is extremely political uh, in the sense that um, it's it's divided uh, between multiple camps that have pretty much that pretty much agree on what in general happened, but disagree fundamentally in terms of the specifics of what happened. So what specifically happened in Turkish coup is actually not a question for a social scientist. It's actually a question for people that study hardcore military sciences or intelligence studies, Mm. um, because the tools that social scientists have are really insufficient in terms of explaining what, because it's not a social phenomenon. It's it's a really top-down, highly confidential, uh, very hard to foresee, very hard to understand phenomenon that only, you know, people that either specifically study coups or, uh, you know, study how militaries and intelligence organizations uh, work in that regard. But so uh, what I think defines the military coup is basically it was an attempt to change um, the status quo in Turkey, in the most um, you know broad kind of definition, uh, basically you know depose the current government, depose the current president, and install uh, a military administration. But we're also not one hundred percent clear about what that military administration, what kind of policies they would. Uh, support what kind of policies they would enact, what kind of ideology they belong to. I mean, of course, the narrative on that is also you know, very much um, divided. So it's a really, uh, I mean, freak incident. Uh, even though it's hard to understand, the uh, effects were very real. Even 
I mean, people in Turkey that would define as you know opposition, uh, they were also pretty much against the coup. Uh, so uh, all walks of political life, maybe ninety five percent, ninety six percent. You know, I'm making up percentages, of course, but you know, my sense was that an overwhelming majority of Turkish people were uh, against the coup. Uh, but of course, after the coup, a new set of you know political you know, calculus emerged. Uh, when you look at other countries that have suffered from coups in the past, so when a coup is successful, you basically have an enormous onslaught. Uh, you know, a lot of people lose their lives. Uh, a lot of people are detained. Um, and when a coup attempt fails, then in every single country, we witness a witch hunt, uh, which goes on for a pretty long time. And basically, Uh, sort of disables the entire uh, political and bureaucratic apparatus of those countries. So in that sense, Turkey fits into uh, that pattern. Uh, The coup failed because uh, people really didn't support the coup. Uh, There was like little support for the coup. And to that end, after the coup attempt failed, now you have this really wide ranging witch hunt that's going on in Turkey. Okay, so... Uh, my my understanding of it is that it was not the whole military or even the upper levels of the military, but it's just a, a a sort of rogue group within the military that that tried to overthrow the government, and that what sets this particular event apart from past coups is just how fast people were able to find out about it and respond. Uh, something that uh, they they seem to have not accounted for and anticipated. So um, let's talk about the the events on the, the day itself. The the coup attempt started on the evening of July fifteenth. Uh, can you walk me through the basic timeline of events? Of course. Um, so basically, I myself I was in Istanbul at that time. Uh, right now, I'm based in Oxford, but I was in Istanbul uh, back then, uh, night of July fifteenth. We were out with friends just having fun and then at about like 9 45 p.m ish uh our families were based in ankara so we started getting calls from uh, our families you know there are low flying jets not just one not just two just multiple uh jets flying low and so basically uh i was the only political scientist among them so i basically did um like a little bit you know you know search my brain what does that mean in basic coup literature low flying jets uh means that there's a mutiny uh not a fully agreed upon coup attempt but a mutiny on the part of one group within the military uh, that are trying to uh, strong arm uh, different political factions into supporting the coup by intimidating them by low jet flights. Basically, that's the reason that they were flying low. And so after about an hour later, uh, Turkish president went up on live TV through phone and basically used this exact term. This is a mutiny, not a coup. The difference being, you know, in Turkey's past, coups were always fully organized incidents in which you have, you know, perfect, almost perfect chain of command. Uh, Top generals agree, colonels, majors, uh, and the rest of the command structure agrees, and you carry out a coup, it's very well organized. Uh, But this time, uh, it was different. I mean, there were some generals involved, some colonels involved, some majors involved. So it wasn't really a hierarchical degree of separation. It was mostly a vertical separation between different factions uh, within the military. Um, And there's actually one uh, Turkish social scientist who is actually a retired member of Turkish Armed Forces. He wrote an excellent a uh, white paper on this, you know, who are these people, you know, who, who who was engaged in this coup attempt. And he basically maps out that chart, you know, people that are just simply anti-government, people that uh, are basically coming from, uh, you know, strong allegiance to a Turkish exile, uh, exiled cleric who is... Uh, living in the United States, but has enormous influence on Turkish politics from abroad. 
So it was basically a combination of those people uh, coming together, but they weren't ideologically well connected. Uh, there were a lot of uh, loyalty problems, uh, and also other parts of Turkish military actually actively resisted against the coup. So in, let's say, a street where you had to have, let's say, 15 tanks, uh, only th three tanks appear or four tanks appear. So uh, that actually made it easier for people to overwhelm those military positions. Uh, and then uh, right after midnight, you have Turkish presidents uh, appearing on uh, TV through FaceTime. I think everybody uh, knows that aspect of the coup, you know, Turkish president appearing on live TV through, uh, not FaceTime. No, yeah, it was FaceTime. Yeah, uh, he, he got connected through FaceTime and basically called all of his supporters into the streets and we basically had you know deeply entrenched military positions versus just people that were out there trying to overwhelm those positions and eventually you know you had about 12 hours uh in in the first 12 hours of you know uh, the morning of 16th of july where different parts of the military i think you know kind of waited, you know, which side is going to win, which side is going to, you know, lose. And eventually what, you know, ended up happening is that those those forces that resisted the coup actually succeeded. So that's basically um, the overall, you know, narrative of the coup. Uh, of course, you know, depending on people from, you know, whichever political background that you talk to, you get you know, different shades of this narrative. So... I think this is the most like objective kind of way I can present it. Right. And and so, you know, if this were the French Revolution or something, all we'd have to go on are, you know, a few accounts and, and the narratives that came out at the time. But since it's uh, since this happened in 2016 and everyone was documenting it in real time through their mobile phones and uh, on, yes. on Twitter, you, you can actually have a much more sort of granular and, and detailed view of what exactly happened when and where. So when you looked at that, uh, what patterns emerged that weren't immediately obvious from the, the, you know, more standard, the narrative that we might have heard reading news reports uh, the day after? Yeah, I mean, I basically started this study as, uh, I think, like a survival mechanism because, uh, you know, um, living a coup is like traumatic enough, but actually living at the center of the city during a coup attempt is basically not nice. Uh, so you have a lot of low flying jets, which, by the way, they do this like rapid dive and then uh it generates this sonic boom mm. it, it sounds as if like they dropped a bomb somewhere and so you have that you have machine gun fire you have um you know explosions happening everywhere so i kind of isolated myself from that uh by you know looking at some of the open source social media data you know what's happening what's being shared so I started to, uh, you know, gather some data, but uh, actually, the people who really, you know, gathered and you know sorted out this data from more like computer science perspective, is that um, there is a Lebanese risk analysis group uh, based in Beirut, a group of architects, computer scientists, geographers. So I've been working with them in the past in a different project on mapping militant selfies. Basically, why do militants in Syria take selfies all the time on the battlefield? Uh, and we were just um, you know, conducting a study on mapping those selfies uh, and generating a war map of sorts. So we basically used you know, a similar technique to gather every single you know, social media posts and whatnot. But the interesting thing this time that because you're dealing with uh, a very small area part of land, just Istanbul city center, and only several hours, uh, we were able to get, uh, you know, pretty good uh, publicly available satellite data as well. So we were able to map 
actual resistance points where people gathered around and resisted against the military coup, then we overlaid that onto the social media resistance map, you know, which parts of Istanbul people, um, you know, sent support tweets in support of people that were resisting against the coup. So that was our second layer. So our third layer was um, interesting because in this particular type of mobilization, anti-coup resistance, I've discovered that mosques and religious networks actually have a lot of influence and a lot of weight in terms of kind of raising the spirits of the people and actually calling them into the streets to resist in that regard. So our third layer was, um, you know, through open geolocation, you know, Google data. We mapped every single mosque in Istanbul and connected them to each other through 400 meter sound range voice range from i mean when when you look at our study you you see that there are like tiny dots connected to each other uh, like a network uh, so those dots indicate mosques and the links indicate that you know that particular mosque can hear call to prayers from the other mosque adjacent to it so we also measured mosque density in a particular place. And finally, we didn't use this data on that foreign affairs piece, but uh, we're using it in this next study that we are doing. We also measured the extent and number of district coordinators of the Justice and Development Party, the governing party in Turkey, to basically answer this question, who actually resisted against the coup? You know, who saved President Erdogan? Was it his own, you know, TV call, his own, you know, did, did FaceTime save Erdogan? Or is it the religious networks and religious brotherhoods? Or is it his own party network? So what we found was... Uh, resistance actually began earlier than both prime minister's speech on TV and also president's speech on TV. There was this kind of an automatic security valve uh, of a group of people who came out into the streets, overwhelmed military positions, um, and basically put the coup attempt into a deadlock. So when you exactly study um, who actually did that, uh, you see that um, resistance, the most important initial resistance, starts in districts with a strong presence of religious brotherhoods and religious networks. So they come out, and after this initial kind of reaction, after those the first two hours, two and a half hours, when President Erdogan can finally go up to TV and say that, you know, go out, it, that's only, it's only then that his party network goes out. So in a way, this challenges the, you know, the, the dominant narrative in Turkey. You know, it's you know, Erdogan calling up on FaceTime, you know, he, he saved the day. And this data shows that it's actually religious networks and religious brotherhoods that saved uh, the night initially. Uh, when the real danger was gone, that's only after that uh, point that you know political party networks start to uh, pour into the streets. So that was uh, probably our you know most interesting finding. Yeah. So re- reading through your foreign affairs piece, you say that people started to notice and started to tweet about what was going on around 10 p.m. when the uh, the rogue military units trying to overthrow the government had, you know, closed off a bridge or, or had started making uh, unusual uh, movements, uh, trucks and tanks uh, moving around. So, mm. so it, it was really, I, I guess the interesting thing is that it was so immediate that people started to, to clue into what was going on at such an early stage, which of yeah. course wouldn't have happened if this were a hundred years ago or even thirty years ago. See, I don't know. I mean, I still think about that. I mean, you may be right. I mean, I'm not saying that you're wrong, but I mean, I'm, I'm still thinking because this study is essentially 
uh, a study that basically warns people uh, who study social networks, political mobilization, in exclusively social media terms. And what I'm saying, at least, is that we are paying too much attention on the social media aspect of it. Um, because in, you know, in, the Ar- in Arab Spring, for example, especially in Tunisia and Egypt, there, there's the saturation of studies on the role of Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, but not enough emphasis on traditional mobilization networks, such as mosques, such as universities, such as coffee houses, such as stadiums, for example, you know, where people have been mobilizing and getting together since, I don't know, like for, for centuries. So this study was, I think, important because it was the first time that we managed to test newer forms of mobilization, which is social media, and measure that against, you know, more like, you know, older types of mobilization, such as mosques or political party networks, and see how traditional and more modern social media, uh, modern social networks uh, kind of compete in mobilizing people. So let's say, I don't know, if this happened 100 years ago, uh, it's hard to predict because this time, both the rogue troops and people who were resisting them, they both used social media. I mean, the resistance used Twitter, Facebook, uh, Instagram, yes. But then the rogue troops uh, used uh, encrypted messaging apps, you know, WhatsApp, Signal, another one so it was actually a digitized affair definitely but i think uh, you know as as a secular person what really surprised me in that sense was that mosques and those ancient old mosque networks uh, are still you know the most dominant forms of you know political participation or uh, public protests even in a time where you have this, this kind of digital interconnectedness. And one interesting finding as well is that parts of Istanbul where you have uh, you know, the highest density of mosque networks, you also have highest participation in the digital media resistance as well, it, which means that religious districts aren't really backward in technology. They're actually better in tune with social media, which is, I think, one of the other, you know, more surprising findings um, of this paper. Okay, so there was a a complementarity then between the sort of the old way of coordinating around mosques or, or, you know, gathering places, social Uh institutions that have lasted, have been around for thousands of years, and then the, the modern technology and allowing you to get in contact with people, you know, farther away and, and, uh, in, yeah. and get the word out to, to different locations where they maybe haven't seen any strange activity yet, yeah. but uh, have heard about it. Uh, just to, to clarify how, how this worked with the mosques, they, they had loudspeakers set up, which they normally use to broadcast uh, prayer or uh, the call to prayer. And, and they, they use these to sound the alarm. Is, is that how it worked? Exactly. I mean, when you look at actually pre-World War I imperial history in places like Austria-Hungarian Empire, Russian Empire, or Ottoman Empire, um, when you had like smaller scale uh, battles and wars or riots in remote towns, um, you would actually see that mosques and churches uh, were actually the primary alarm systems that would notify people. I mean, even in like medieval times, you know, when you hear a church bell, it means that there's either a war or the, you know, the king has died or something like the church bells, you know, signify, you know, some sort of alarm as well. The same thing goes with call to prayers with mosques. Uh, You know, they are, you know, in daily practice, call to prayers, you know, they call people to prayer, but also in crisis periods, uh, in mobilization periods, they were uh, used as, you know, alarm towers, as well as, you know, constantly broadcasting call to prayers as a way to raise morale and, uh, you know, bolster, you know, group identity and group behavior. So in that sense, what the mosques did on July 15th in Turkey 
is actually what they have been doing in the last, I don't know, several centuries. So what is different this time is that we were just there this time to measure it. Mm. I mean, they, they have been doing these things forever. It's just that we're now there. We have the tools to measure, you know, because just to give you an idea, in certain places on Istanbul, when, uh, you know, the, the coup took place, you have jets flying around, um, you know, bombs and everything. So it's pretty traumatic and it's pretty scary. A lot of people just locked up their doors. You know, there, there was something, you know, really troubling. Uh, some people, especially in like conservative places, you would notice that some of them actually started coming out when they started hearing call to prayers. That was kind of a rallying call uh, in that sense. And after, you know, certain districts sounding this call to prayer, uh, you would have hundreds and hundreds of people pouring out into the streets. So again, like when I talk about this to like an outsider, of course, it sounds really interesting. But to reiterate, this is basically standard and typical uh, mosque behavior in times of crisis. For example, when there's a natural disaster, an earthquake, a flood or something, you know, mosques in rural areas do this call to prayer to basically warn people, you know, there's something going on. And if you're sleeping, you wake up, or, you know, if you're doing something else, you're like, you know, this is not prayer hour, so there must be something wrong going on. So you go out and, you know, see what's happening. So it's, it's really interesting in terms of, like, cultural anthropology as well, too. But, uh, you know, to my interest, uh, you know, I was able to measure all of these things, which is which was pretty cool. So Yeah, um, I, I guess uh, if we think about it in maybe game theory kind of terms, the fact that it's on a loudspeaker, it, it creates common knowledge, right? I know that everyone else can hear that if I can hear it. Uh, and so, mm-hmm. you know, you, you don't want to be the one person going out and resisting a coup, you're just going to get yourself shot. But if you know that everyone else can hear that and you know that everyone else is is being called out to to act, then, you know, there's safety in numbers, right? And you can coordinate through that. I'm, I'm sort of realizing that uh, that my my the own my own neighborhood, my own uh, community city that I live in doesn't have anything like the mosque network, and that if there were an emergency, I would have no idea where, where to coordinate or how to respond to it. Uh, maybe it's maybe a, a different topic. <laughs> you would you would probably have sirens. Yes, yes. So uh, because when you think about it, sirens were invented at a time when just simple church bells or free loudspeaker call to prayers, you know, calls to prayer. They were just simply unable to address larger cities. So Siren was invented to let hundreds of thousands of people across a really large area of coverage to, you know, realize that there was something going on. So the best of my knowledge, there there are no like loudspeakers for churches or church bells. But so I think Islam, you know, adopted loudspeakers to reach a, a larger area in that sense. Uh, but, uh, you know, both Muslim countries and non-Muslim countries use sirens. So I mean, mm-hmm. my, my sense is blue. But so the, the thing is, in Turkey, if you wanted to sound the sirens, you would need some sort of clearance from the military or, you know, local commands because they were in charge of sounding those alarms against airstrikes, bombings or whatnot. So if there's a coup and if you want to mobilize people, you can access a siren. Uh, because, you know, the, the military is at that point very much divided. So you have to fall back to your second option in mobilizing people that you use in rural areas. In rural areas, you don't really have sirens. You still use the mosques. So these are like really fascinating topics for, you know, sociologists or social anthropologists. So I, I mentioned at the start, we would get to discussing the more technical side of the study. So you know, it's a geospatial study and you have you have different data sets that have coordinates, you know, so you you have specific tweets being made at, at specific places at specific times. You have, you know, maps of the cities with different locations uh, that, you know, the um, you know, the coordinates of 
And you sort of run into a problem of having almost too much data. You know, how, how do you go about sifting through, you know, this vast amount of information to get something, you know, meaningful, some meaningful result out of it? I mean, uh, you know, I know I should answer this question by saying, oh, we use, you know, big data mm-hmm. analytics, computational. No, we use Excel. <laughs> I'm so sorry. You know, just good old Excel. Um, because... Yes, you have large amounts of data, but to call something big data, uh, one, either data needs to be coming in real time or existing data needs to be changing in real time. So what differentiates big data from data that is just, you know, has a large volume is that big data is unpredictable. It changes. So that's why you have to teach your machine to understand, learn, and respond to that changing data. So that's the relationship between big data and machine learning. So what we use is basically simply logged geospatial data, which isn't changing. It's historical. Mm -hmm. It is just sitting somewhere. So it was just a very large Excel file uh, in which you have locations of mosques, locations of uh, tweets, you know, heat maps of satellite imagery uh, on where people resisted. And then you just throw them into Stata. I mean, sorry, I don't use R, I use Stata. Mm. It's, I, I think it's simpler. Of course, like if, if I were doing this in real time, let's say if we were using this, doing this study on the night of 15th, where you have a lot of data pouring in, uh, you don't know whether you know, certain types of data is actually correct or not, whether it's fake news or just your know, balloon propaganda, you know, or lies outright. So for that kind of real-time study, I think you would need Python uh, and machine learning and big data skills. But I mean, we collected data, then we had a lot of time in terms of like sorting that data uh, doing redundancy checks so that you don't, you know, in, you know, process same data twice or three times. And eventually, you really have a very simple Excel file, which you can then export to Stata. And then, uh, you know, regression analysis, I mean, is there a relationship between mosque density, how strong Justice and Development Party networks are in that given district? Uh, and whether that district was physically mobilized or digitally mobilized. Right. So Number of tweets, number of people on the streets. So it was easy to measure after that point. Okay. So, so um, do you break it down into specific districts or do you kind of, um, you know, have some kind of uh, kernel density waiting to, to find, you know, what areas... No, you know, to to generate more of yeah. like a heat map, uh, is it discrete? Is it uh, h- how does it work? Um, it works in terms of district. So, um, is that, I mean, Turkish Statistical Institute is really good in that sense. I mean, they have good district data, not just on Istanbul, but um, a lot of cities in Turkey as well. So, uh, you divide Istanbul based on its individual electoral districts. So in those electoral districts, you can measure, you know, number of mosques, how many district coordinators uh, operate that belong to Justice and Development Party. What is the vote percentage change in that individual district between two elections, whether that district is a predominantly Erdogan supporter or not. And then geolocated data from Twitter which, by the way, remind me to talk a little bit on that geolocation thing afterwards. So geolocated tweets, you know, what kind of hashtags that they use. Um, uh, so you, you basically have a very tidy uh, Excel sheet in which uh, you have all this data that you're measuring uh, sorted according to individual districts. Right. And so you could, uh, for instance, knowing people... Obviously, there are opinion polls and elections and, and a lot yes. of data at the district level. And so you could, for instance, find out that a lot, you know, maybe w- which you could correlate the districts that su- had a lot of support for uh, the, the president and see wh- when and whether they they resisted and in what numbers. Is that that's correct? Yeah, exactly. Right. So, and and your your finding is was that it 
in the early stages, it was the uh, networks, uh, the districts with more mosques rather than the, the districts with more Erdogan supporters uh, that, that mobilized. Is that uh, roughly correct? So I was, I was giving, I mean, I was presenting this research where I'm a visiting fellow right now at the Oxford Internet Institute. And uh, some of the participants actually made a good contribution. He said, you know, this, you know, regression and whatnot looks good. Uh, but, you know, if you can, if, I mean, if you have at least like, um, you know, time series or time frequency data on actual physical mobilization versus digital mobilization, like what time specifically, which districts tweeted or came out into the street, you can do a regression analysis based on like every two hour intervals. And when you do it, you can actually come up with a better idea on, you know, which districts came out first kind of statistical analysis. But it's a great idea. But when you basically divide that data into two hourly intervals, then um, the number of data becomes just very small with every single uh, model. So I, in that regard, I can answer your question based on like personal observation. And basically, you know, the results uh, of the data itself without even relying on time series data or time frequency data is that you don't have higher mobilization in districts that have high level of support for the president. You have high level of participation from districts that have highest mosque density and Highest mosque density isn't perfectly correlated uh, to support for President Erdogan, which is another interesting finding. So because what's the narrative? You know, President Erdogan, you know, is a conservative leader and he is supported by, you know, uh, conservative Muslim segments of the society. So you would expect mosque density to pretty much explain electoral support for Erdogan, but that's not the case. That's an interesting finding too. Okay. And so it seems like it was the, you know, the the rate at which these different networks were able to get together and find out what was happening and coordinate rather than people's sort of raw level of support. So, uh, but I mean, on the, on the other hand, if a democratically elected leader who I personally didn't vote for or didn't support was going to be overthrown in a coup d'etat, I, I can see myself still acting against that because uh, pe- people didn't know what what was going to come out of this coup d'etat. They 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 yes. maybe didn't have time to consider that. Well, you know, maybe maybe these rogue military units are, are going to be better than than our elected leaders. And so I, I can see uh, opposition not necessarily being limited to the people who would just who, you know, the voters, the people who would vote for the existing leader, because a lot of people just care about democracy itself m- more so than any particular hmm. leader. Right. I think mosque networks um, were afraid that just like you said, uh, you know, I mean, they may not specifically vote for Erdogan, but like they're not, I don't think like, I mean, if you don't like Erdogan, it doesn't mean that you want him to go. It's, it's, it's an interesting um, <clears throat> like behavior. Like you don't like Erdogan's politics, but you know that there are no alternatives. So even if you don't vote Erdogan, you also don't vote for any other party and just become a non-voter. But in that kind of choice between a military administration and Erdogan, uh, you fear a military administration far more than you know, the problems that you associate with Erdogan, for example. So you, even if you don't vote for Erdogan, you can still go out and defend the status quo. Status quo meaning not like Erdogan ruling, but as you know, an ongoing parliamentary system, an imperfect democracy, but still some sort of democracy, you know, there's some sort of choice in that regard. Because if military takes over, there's like no choice, uh, nothing. So that's why, you know, for, you know, within the rest of the society too, like I think people were pretty much overwhelmingly against the coup because of this dimension. I mean, you may be unhappy with Erdogan, but 
you know that you will be far unhappier with the military administration. And you know at least there will be another election where you could maybe get him out through legitimate means. Whereas uh, in, in the case of a coup, you, you, know, you could lose that opportunity uh, very realistically. I wanted to come back to the, the geospatial data you, you mentioned. Um, the, it's actually kind of, uh, for, for non-social scientists, it's kind of creepy that, uh, that their, uh, their location is always being tracked. But it's really interesting for us. So uh, talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so the thing about geolocation. So normally when I did this study, I was expecting very small percentage of actual data with geolocation to come out. Um, because, you know, people are smart. They no longer turn on their geolocation. Uh, even if there are some people that turn on their geolocation, uh, they would be maybe less than five percent or four percent of the overall data but one interesting finding uh i got from this project that i did before mapping militant selfies in syria how the islamic state or kurdish militants for example use selfies as a propaganda tool one interesting finding was in crisis periods people turn on their geolocation at an absurd rate hmm. like um i start to like inquire you know do some inquiries into why like why in in a war setting you would turn your geolocation on and one answer i came up with after i mean of course like i i don't have the clearance to interview with returning militants or not but i was talking to people from different government agencies who were interested in radicalization or why people choose to go violent and become foreign fighters, uh, is that so these people on the battlefield aren't afraid of dying because they understand that taking up arms at some level pretty much you know, brings a possibility of being killed. What they're afraid of is being forgotten. And that is a very powerful psychological tool. So people on the battlefield and these are just some of them are like 20 year like 20 year old kids even like 16 17 or 18 like they're very young so when you um kind of look from their perspective and they already kind of understand the fact that they, they're going to die at some point uh what they want is to leave a permanent mark on the battlefield so that that would be the thing that's going to live on after they die and they want to make sure that, uh, you know, especially before going into a battle, an ambush or something, uh, they make sure that they take a selfie first uh, because they're just dudes, mm -hmm. like dudes that are you know, taking a selfie and then, and then put a hashtag, which is usually their message, and then add another message and then go fighting. So... While I was expecting maybe, again, 5%, 4% of geolocation, geolocated information in our selfie study, I ended up having about 85% geolocation rating in you know, all the tweets, Instagram posts, and Facebook posts, which is ridiculous. Wow. So why is this the case? Like why almost everybody is turning on their geolocation one propaganda it means that i am here i'm not hiding and also it bolsters uh group morale meaning that we are attacking this group here and we're turning on our geolocation quite comfortably because we don't we're so strong that we have absolutely no fear of being counter-attacked one of the islamic militant uh, islamic state militants actually had a drone uh, drop a bomb onto him by doing this specifically. He turned on geolocation, shared it up on Twitter, and then killed by a drone strike like several seconds later. So there's a threat to that. But in Turkish coup, of course, like not the same psychology, but a comparable psychology emerged. Uh, like people wanted to make sure that they are out there, uh, they are resisting, and they're, they're turning on geolocation to call other people, other supporters to their location. So they would check in in a particular place and basically post it up on Twitter on fa or Facebook or Instagram saying that this is where we are, you know, come help us. 
uh, and it will be easier for uh, people in their homes to actually go and find that place. So uh, the geolocation percentage in that Istanbul study was about 75%, which is, again, really high. So, yes, I mean, geolocation is a scary thing, but, like, I'm not using geolocation against their against people's wish or will i mean they very consciously turn on their geolocation and they check in to those specific places in uh, a public setting hoping that people are going to see that geolocation so they're not hiding their information so um that's why i think ethically it's you know I mean, it's open source uh, to begin with, but I mean, from an ethical point of view, they, I mean, it's, it's a choice. Like they could have just said, we are at this bridge without actually turning on their geolocation, but no, they turn their geolocation, check into a certain place and it becomes data. Yeah. I mean, you know, if I were doing something potentially dangerous, if I had some worries, you know, you might. I can see myself turning my geolocation on and making it public, you know, so that if something happens to me, people can find me, right? People know where I was. They can, you know, if I may be hurt or, or can't get contact with someone, you know, it, sometimes it's a good thing to have people know where you are. Yeah, yeah. And, and just, you know, to broadcast and to coordinate in the moment. So w what would you... uh what would you say to, say, a grad student who is interested in studying other events using this sort of geospatial uh, approach? Um, wh what are the major, you know, pitfalls or things that people should know if they're if they're interested in in this sort of analysis? Yeah, I mean, good question. Uh, one thing I would really recommend, and that would be like number one thing, uh, is that do you do you don't have to do multi-method research, but have an aptitude and an interest in for, for doing multi-method research. If you're a computer, computer scientist, uh, go, you know, be friends with or partner up with sociologists, international relations people, economists, or political science people. If you are doing political science or IR, it's the other way around. Go be friends with or um, develop research partnerships with um, economists or computer scientists. Because one thing I discovered here at OII, um, OII meaning Oxford Internet Institute, like I've been here for a month and a half, uh, and I discovered myself as an international relations person uh, speaking more to computer sciences crowd rather than other international relations people. Right now, we're going through this period of time when uh, multi-method um, research, computational, social science is becoming like so popular and all for the good reasons um, that, you know, be, of course, good with your theory, be good with your you know, methodological approach. Um, but also, do not try to do everything yourself. For example, if you're going to learn how to code as a social scientist, by all means, I mean, go learn how to code, learn R, learn uh, Python. But not to the extent that uh, you are actually spending time to replicate a lot of studies or skill sets yourself. Instead, uh, have a good basic foundation in Python or R so that it will allow you to communicate with computer scientists better. And go find people, partner up with them, uh, do multi-author studies. One, it's going to be easier for uh, every person because every single person is going to you know, deploy their own strong points. Uh, it's going to translate into uh, you know, more articles at a shorter amount of time. So that would be my main thing. I mean, you know, do interdisciplinary research. Uh, it, it's a matter of opportunity as well. Not everybody would have that kind of opportunity. Just, I mean, I think I would say be interested in it. Just being interested and, you know, looking for opportunities is, you know, half of the thing. Because when you start looking at your environment through that perspective, you discover that you actually have those tools or people who know about these things around you. Uh, so I think that awareness is really important. Um, the second thing I would suggest is 
do a lot of redundancy check. I mean, spend a lot of time on redundancy because uh, one of the things, one of the biggest pitfalls that we encountered while doing the militant selfies thing or the Turkish crew thing, I mean, fake news is a huge problem. Fake data is another huge problem in the sense that, let's say, a militant group taking a selfie, then firing a rocket on a tank. So we ended up discovering at least like 15 different angles uh, of the same uh, incident in which uh, a tank is you know, blown up. And they all kind of tried to upload it onto the internet saying that we destroyed 15 tanks. Although what they were doing was just destroying one tank and shooting it from 15 different angles. So how do you do that? I mean, that's basically for computer scientists, of course. You have video and image recognition algorithms. Uh, you have to deploy that into your you know, popular movement, public protest, or war studies, so that you don't end up reporting 15 instances of the same event. That will be the main technical uh, thing that I would. But most of my suggestions are basically project-specific and not very general. We are all new to this, even like the biggest professors are new to this, so we're learning. And I think um, this new trend towards computational social science is a very good thing. Uh, I would, it's really fun. I would really recommend uh, grad students and PhD students to develop an interest in this because we need more people, uh, not just computer scientists, but social scientists that also have an interest in working with uh, computer science people. So that will be it. My guest today has been Akin Unver. Uh, Akin, thanks for being part of Economics Detective Radio. My pleasure. Thank you. If you enjoyed that episode of Economics Detective Radio, head over to economicsdetective.com slash C-O-U-P for the transcript and links to all the articles and things we mentioned in the episode. If you want to support the show, you can do so through Patreon, which is a service that allows you to make small recurring donations to content creators like me who produce things and put them out on the internet for free, such as this podcast. I'd like to give a special thank you to G, my latest supporter on Patreon. G and others help to keep the show going and, you know, keep my expenses covered. Uh, it's uh, hosting and uh, I, I've been getting transcripts done. I can't do that myself because I, of course, don't have enough time and nor do I have the comparative advantage. You know, it's all about delegating it's all about division of labor so thanks to g and others i can do that and i can keep this show going and i can produce episodes most weeks i I try to do it every week but if i can't i'll try to do it as many weeks as possible so thank you and i'll see you next week